Hello, listeners. Good morning. Good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're at. I see we have uh, listeners from uh, International, and I'm sure there's listeners from the East Coast um, and West Coast. It's a, a beautiful day here in California, San Dimas, California. For It's a great day for a webinar. And thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, I really feel like this webinar has plenty of uh, good information that you guys, you know, can use and take with you on your next install. So you won't have, you know, you won't run into, you know, some of these issues that we're going to cover. My name is Ken Miguel. I'll be hosting today's webinar. Of course, this webinar is brought to you by Bull Light Technology Group with over 25 years of experience. In video surveillance, we offer only the latest and greatest in IP video, high def over coax, uh, DVRs, NVRs, all accessories pertaining to CCTV. You name it, we got it. And here with me um, to assist is Mike Lugo. He is one of our top technical support engineers here at Bolide. Mike, how are you? I'm doing great, Ken. Thanks for asking. Hope everybody out there is having a great day. And Mike is really the perfect guy to help me out with this webinar because he has pretty much heard it all, right? I've heard just about every situation. Uh, almost? <laughs> almost. There's <laughs> almost always something new, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, if you guys um, ever call uh, Bolide Tech Support, um, it's a good chance they're going to be speaking with him or uh, one of the guys on his team. So... In this webinar uh, that we titled Most Common Problems Installers Run Into and How to Fix Them. Okay, so in this webinar, we're going to go over, first of all, the basics, how to pick the right camera, the right technology for the right job, how to use the equipment properly for a clean install, and resolving common problems. Uh, these vary. Uh, we're going to talk about video image issues, you know, some of the common things that happen that causes you to see, you know, we're, you know, you're, you're not getting the, the perfect image that you need, you know, for a particular application. Uh, we're going to cover installation problems. Now, these may cover lack of equipment, um, not utilizing accessories and equipment um, properly. Uh, we're going to go over um, all the technologies available to you guys, whether it's IP, video, or analog slash high def over coax. Um, and power. Uh, a, lo a lot of this you, you guys will see will be power related. And Mike's going to go over how to overcome the challenges. Okay, so let's start. Guys, this webinar, uh, we, we like it to be an open forum, just like you know our, our past webinars. So if you have any questions, there is a questions box on your screen. Feel free to type any questions that you may have um, on the topics that we're going to cover, and we're going to stop and try to answer them all throughout the uh, webinar. Okay, so let's go over some uh, data that we collected. Um, FYI, so number one, 65% of service calls are due to problems with video transmission, including cables, connectors, and how they were installed. Number two, 27% of service calls are related to power, I agree, such as inadequate or excessive or wrong voltage, uh, grounding problems, and environmental issues, whether it's temperature um, or vibration. Number three, 7% of system problems are due to installation errors, including improper termination, connectors, BNCs, RJ45, you name it. Incorrect equipment setup and mistakes made by installation personnel. Only 
of CCTV system problems are caused by actual equipment failure due to defects in you know the product material uh, or quality. That's good to know as a manufacturer. Yeah, it it's is. not always our fault. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, let's start the right camera for the right job. Yeah, it's good. So, I'm basically going to go over just like we said basics of of the install and why sometimes we get uh, images that we are not happy with. And the first one I'm going to go over is I'm pretty sure some of the installs I've seen IR whiteout, and this is caused by an image being too close to the IR at night when they come on and just whites out the whole image. What do we do? How do we fix that? That's a very common common issue with, with IR. So any we, IR cameras, really? Correct. So there's a technology out there, if you guys aren't aware of it, it's called Smart IR. And what this does is actually adjust the amount of light that an IR will give out to stop that wire. You can see the picture on the left. You have a perfect image. The IR gives just enough light to not get that white out. So that's a pretty important um, tip. Oh, what if you don't have a smart IR camera? What are some of the some of the things that you might want to watch out for in yeah, terms so of IR? Distance wise, distance, angle, distance, and, and I'm gonna go over a couple other things with the IRs because they can get tricky. It's not just you got to figure IR just because we don't see it with our human eye. It's still light. It's still a light source, and it acts just like any other light would uh, in terms of when the video picks it up. So it's very important that you keep that in mind. So what about situations where you have a dark image because of background light? Are we going to revisit IRs with another Yeah, slide? we are. Yeah, I'm going to get back into IRs. I just want to go over a couple key topics, and I'll go into detail into uh, pretty much all these all these topics. So dark images. How do you correct that? During the day. During the day. For those of you who don't know or are not familiar with wide dynamic range, uh, it's a sensor that allows the light in the background to not affect the light in the foreground. Um, and there's two kinds. There's a digital wide dynamic and there's a mechanical wide dynamic. And of course, mechanical is better. It's a true wide dynamic. And you're going to get the best picture with that. So and the reason why we bring this up is because when you go to install a camera, you want to make sure, like we said in the beginning, that you have the right camera for the job. And third, like I said, coverage. We're going to go over some coverage issues that we run into. Um, when you do and you spec out a job, do you have the right camera covering the right amount of, of area? So let's take a look at that first of all. It's a good idea to map out your cameras on a, make a map of the whole install. Make sure that you have the right angle, the right focal length, and you're covering the right area. And here is just a quick focal coverage diagram, the one third most common uh, camera out there. So in terms of feet and millimeters, you can see here, and if you guys need a copy of this, we can probably get it to you. Um, but how many feet that camera is going to be able to see out with a good picture and how wide? So this is pretty good to keep in mind when you have corners, when you have uh, areas where you need more coverage. You want to keep this in mind. It's not just a camera. I'm going to go throw it up and hope that it's going to cover this area. And keep in mind, and we get asked this about this all the time. Um, for example, it's you know, uh, a dome camera, and I get asked, or we get asked, hey, I have, I have to see 50 feet or, or 100 feet away. Will this camera do the job? And the answer is, can your eyes see if an object 100 feet away? Yeah, you can. However, are you able to recognize what you're seeing at 100 feet? Yeah. And, I mean, you'll see something, but not right. Keep in mind, this is video surveillance, and number one goal of video surveillance is to have a clear uh, screenshot of a person's face when they're committing a crime, and 
having that type of distance, I mean, you, you, you might you can uh, use a, a longer focal length camera, but your typical 2.8 to 12 uh, very focal cameras at 100 feet, just keep that in mind. Look, look with your own eyes that far away. And if it's too far with your eyes, it's probably too far for the camera. Uh, what's your solution? He mentioned yeah, so no, positioning. Yep. Move it closer. Yep, move it closer. Know, know what the install is going to take. Know the right camera. If you need a hunt, something that's going to see 100 feet away, you don't, typically don't want to go with you know, a, a 2.8 to 12 millimeter camera. You might maybe, maybe think about a 6 to 60 millimeter, something that's going to have more of a, a focal range to cover what you want. You know, and, and if you cannot move it closer, but you can't find uh, anywhere to, to, to install the camera, you can use even a PTZ mm -hmm. that can see that far away. But even then, you have to watch your IR you know, distance at night. Um, but best way is to position the, a camera that, that makes, that gets a good view of the object that you want to see. And it should, it shouldn't be too far away. You have to be able to recognize this object with your eyes. Yeah. If very you're looking at a certain distance. Very, very important. Again, just real quick, the importance of having a clean install. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Problems that you can have from having, you know, uh, unclean install, electrical interference. Hey, Mike. Risk of, of damage to cables, connectivity issues, um, it's troubleshooting nightmares, basically. Uh, it can be just one problem after another. Just get it right the first time. You don't have to worry about that. So in conclusion to that first part, just take care of the little things, and you won't have to worry about about issues later on. Take care of the headaches, and that's done. So let's get into a little more uh, in-depth problem solving. Okay, so resolving common video problems. Okay, so cycle video disturbances, ghosting, color lines. I'm pretty sure every installer has seen these on their their uh, TVs or monitors. And any of these instances, it's a very common misconception, and they want to blame the equipment. So we advise test it, bench test it before you take it out. Make sure that the camera is working. It's not the camera. Because most of the time, it's not. It's going to be something else. So can you explain to, to our listeners what ghosting is? Um, yeah. So, so. And the lines? Yeah. So ghost. Let's go over ghosting first of all. So if you can see this picture below, it looks like there's some kind of object that's not really there. Discoloration, um, things like that. Ghosting lines typically right away we think it's an electrical problem something's wrong with the power box but what so when you plug your power adapter into an electrical circuit that's improperly grounded you're going to see lines going through scrolling through your image how do you correct this well just keep in mind that it may not be a problem with the install it may not be a problem with the equipment it could be a electrical problem entirely and there may not be any solution that you can do off the hand, right off the bat for this. Um, so know that it wasn't a bad install, it wasn't bad equipment. It's a power with the location. Um, so always bench test before so you're able to tell the customer, look, it's not my install. Stuff is good. We need to check the power in the house or location. So who can... In that case, the electrician's going to have to get out there and, and you know, it's pretty much out of our hands out of your hands there's not much we can do you know but know that it's not the equipment it's not the install so check your ground check your ground another one i'm pretty sure guy you have seen these types of images before um and this could be distortion in the actual run itself uh, cables ran can cause distortion interference when when you replace the equipment so um, cables might have staples going through the actual run. Um, rodents, pests might be eat through the actual protective layer of the cable. Um, the adapter that you 
installed at the end might be the problem and you'll see these so when you see this type of picture now we know it's not an electrical problem it's a cable issue a cable issue is going to give you this type of picture and this is this is ghosting you can see the ghosting it looks like there's something there kind of i'm not sure what it is i can't really make it out but it looks pretty much like a ghost or some kind of ghost object lastly another very common issue is so irs and there's a few things we're going to go over here one very very common issue <clears throat> in this picture you can see the little dots uh, along some of the pictures there what is that so every camera that has irs has a ring around the actual lens um, i can recall one uh, installer that had his team out there and he called and it was like a 16 channel he said all 16 cameras have these dots all over the image well it was a new installer and he went and upon adjusting the dome he threw all the rubbers out thinking they were just an extra piece <laughs> so every single camera had these dots so he had to go back and put the rubbers in every single camera to get rid of these dots and with this basically what these rubbers are is they separate the reflection from the irs and the lens this is a very common problem very very common I see this Don't a lot. remove any part of the camera. Yeah. They're in there for a reason. <laughs> and some of them you can't remove. There's a little spring there. Some of them you can. It just depends on the model, different uh, form factors, and they had to do things a certain way. But very important. You see those rings. We know that it's reflection from the, the uh, IRs. So what about glare? Um, as you can see in these images, it looks like a fog these images the ir what's happening here is there's actually reflection coming from an object close to the camera not even in view of the camera now like i said earlier remember this is it's still light even though we can't see it with our naked eye the camera picks it up as light as any light would so there can be trees or bushes around with moisture on them the lights bouncing off the moisture giving you this image um so always remember, like we talked about earlier, when you install a camera, make sure you have, it's at the right height. There's nothing around it that's going to give it any kind of, of um, light bounce back. Um, we get this a lot saying, what's wrong with the camera? There's nothing in front of it. There's nothing on the lens. What's going on? And so there you go. It's an object around the camera that's actually affecting the picture. So how do you, how do you resolve this? You pretty much... Try different angles. Try different angles. Try, you know, when you initially map out map out the install, like I said, I always map it out first. You want to make sure that there's nothing in the immediate vicinity of the camera's view that's going to give you this type of, of, of thing. You're going to put it on top of some bushes or maybe a shed that has a lot of reflective material on it. It's going to have that light bounce back, um, stuff like that. You want to make sure that there's nothing going to interfere with the with that glare. And keep in mind, IRs work pretty much like a flashlight. Uh, if you point a flashlight out into clear space, it's really nothing. It's yeah. no light. You don't see anything. Um, it needs a surface for it to bounce off of, right? Yeah, it's, that's, and that's a good, that's a, a, a very good thing to say because if you have your IRs into nothing, we get calls saying, well, the IRs aren't working. I can't see anything but they're going into things. So you're not going to see anything until something actually crosses the view of that actual light. Point it down towards the ground. Yeah. Out of an angle that's, that will allow it to hit the ground closer, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. And what about um, white surfaces? I, I've, I've heard of issues with white or like white cars. Yeah. Um, so where it could mess with irs a little bit right yeah so like i said like if it's next to a shed or something i say shed because it's a big white object when you install you want to stay away from that uh, or at least angle it away because you're going to get reflection just like you know a good test is throw a flashlight at it light bounces back then you know that you're going to have a lot of ir reflective uh light coming back um especially with with dome cameras especially with dome and cameras. you you hear um People running into uh, seeing uh, the halo. Yeah. What we call halo. Yep. What 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 causes the halo, especially for vandal-proof dome cameras? 
so that rubber has a lot to do with it. That rubber has a lot to do with it. And a lot of times uh, customers think that it might even be a debris on the actual dome itself. Majority of the time, it's not. The culprit is probably, like we talked about, something in the area of the IR giving you that light back. It's not the actual camera. And once again, bench test. Before you get out there, test it. Make sure you're not going to have any issues with the camera itself. Then when you get out there, you know that it's not the camera. You know that it's it's going to be something that's that's in the area yeah. of the camera. Oh, keep in mind that light vents. So yes. having that dome-shaped plastic housing could, you know, definitely affect the the way I, the IR Correct. is balanced. Another solution is use a a flat camera, which yeah. is what like a like an eyeball or a eyeball. bullet. Yeah. It won't run into the same issues as uh, a round manual proof dome. Yeah. Another another issue that I just I just came to mind. I totally forgot to put it in the slides, but is uh, on a vandal dome, you have a protective cover, black cover in the back, or you angle you angle it in an area where the IR sensor cannot be cannot get light into it, and the IRs don't come on. Make sure that you have adequate light, being able to come in to turn those IRs back on, and it doesn't stay in black and white mode. This happens a lot. We see a lot of this. You want to make sure that that camera is at the right angle to receive light in that IR sensor and um, putting them in under eaves putting, exactly put them under eaves the sun is not able or light fixtures are not able to get up in that eave um, sh shade can be too much shade and not let the light come in so yeah you so very the very IRs will engage during the day correct correct and I've seen also part of the IR hitting part of the dome housing oh yes so make sure that when you leave the camera at the angle that you want that none of the irs leds are covered are covered by yeah. either the housing itself yeah. or an eve or yeah. really anything that because it will bounce off of that object yeah. and you will run into uh what you see on this screenshot right now. and the downside is you know you do installs in the daytime we understand. And so nighttime comes and you don't realize that when you installed it in the day, once the IRs come on, now you have this issue and you get customers calling you saying, oh, well, you know, this is going on. It looked fine in the day, but at night you have these issues. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a hard thing to, to have to deal with, you know, because you don't, people don't work at night usually because customers don't want to be bothered at night. So keep it in mind when you're doing the installs, you want to just try to map it out correctly. What do our listeners uh, need to know as far as IR distance? So IR distance, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, it flashing into nothing. And you're not going to be able to see or really tell how far a distance is. And the distances vary anywhere, no more than 100 feet, I would say. That's a really, really good IR. Um, 100 feet is pretty far away. So you have a lot of objects in between 100 feet. So make sure it's at a adequate height. Because anything low, you're going to have a lot of uh, bounce back from that. 100 feet is pretty, pretty far away. Right. It's, it's like with lens. The closer the object, the better. The better, Don't yeah. Don't push the, the camera yeah. to the limit. Yeah. Because uh, you're, you're going to have to sacrifice yeah. the video and be able, be able to recognize a person. Yeah, you have to be able to find that at that in between. You know, you're going to give up something for something all the time. And just know what it is that the customer needs and be able to get the right camera for that situation. Okay. Well, if you guys have any more questions or I've seen other issues with IR, go ahead and type your questions in the questions box and we'll answer them for you. Yeah. We have a question here about rolling lines. Yeah. So rolling lines um, is a bit, like I said, it is a, a power issue. And I'm going to actually get into rolling lines very, a little more detailed. Uh, the whole power, power problem. It's a, big problem cctv um and running analog cameras that's probably one of the biggest issues so yeah i'll touch on the rolling lines and also a couple other uh video display lines that appear and how to distinguish what the difference is um so conclusion with irs uh make sure that your installation yeah. is proper yeah. uh, um, as far as ir leds 
make sure that you do test them um, um, at daytime or at nighttime. Yes. Um, how do you test nighttime? How do you simulate a nighttime image during the day? So you can put your hand over the IRs to see if they come on, see how strong they are. Um, you know, it's it's a hard thing to do is test it in the day. Um, like I said earlier, it's just it's one of those things. Um, so the best thing to do is, is bench test it in your office. Know the capability of the camera. Know how far, how strong the lights are. Know the area it's going to cover before you take it out to the location because you're not – most likely you're going to be done with the install before the sun sets. So if you know more or less, you know, the camera's capabilities, then – it helps out a little bit. Some things you just can't help. And unfortunately, uh, that's how it is. But, you know, the more tools you have in your bag and in your head, the better off you are at the install. So, yeah. Well, there's certain cameras, camera styles that allow you to be a bit more well, careless. Or true, very true. There's some, some, especially dome cameras that you have yeah. to be more careful. Yes. In yes. installing because they cause... Issues the dome. Um, issues the, with, with IRs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically, like we said in the beginning, know your cameras, know the right camera for the right job. Make sure that it's it's the right thing. Okay. So install problems. Uh, what are we looking at here? So install problems. So ask, ask yourself a few questions before you begin your installation. Number one, what CCTV technology am I installing? What type of cable should I use? Will there any be any other hardware or accessory that I would need to use this particular wire? Um, bit, uh, another chunk of inf information here, uh, like it was, we mentioned earlier, 7% of, of, of problems are due to Improper termination, incorrect equipment, and mistakes by the personnel. And you want to avoid that 7% chance. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, so IP systems. Know the limits of the system or wire or technology you're using. We know that CAT5 is going to limit you to 300 feet. CAT6, around 450. But that's data. Um, so 300 yeah. feet and 450. Yeah. But that's, like I said, that's data. What about power? So we can get data. We know how far data goes, but does power go that same length? So let's, let's touch a bit on, on those uh, on those questions. And uh, another one is how do I break uh, the data distance limitations? Let's go over a couple of those things. Well, we know that data, how far data can travel with Ethernet. Does power have those same restrictions? Well, yes. And sometimes they have more restrictions. Um, so the standard PoE, 48 volt, um, 802.3, according to the IEEE um, group, says that you'll get 300 feet power from a PoE um, device. But most PoE NVRs, and that's across, across the board, will only give you in about 250 feet. That's way less than... A regular PoE. We're talking PoE MVRs. Why? Because it's splitting the distance of the power and the processing power to do that video. So you're going to lose um, power. You have restrictions, and that's you might even get less than that if you have multiple runs going, you know, lengths of, of 200 feet. So how do you fix that? So straight shot from the camera to the MVR. If you're using a built-in PoE MVR. 250 feet, guys. Yeah, and, and that's, like I said, that's pushing it. That's if, if you have one. So how do you get around that? What do you do? What, what, what's out there? Um, so thanks to some of the breakthroughs in technology, we have a couple things that you can do to uh, help that. Accessories, converters, adapters, um, to break those distance limitations. We have a question here. Um, does the quality of your network cable affect distance? limitation so yes and no i want to say yes because like we talked about earlier cat 6 cat 5 you're going to get a further you can be able to run a distance further with cat 6 than you would with cat 5 other than that that's the good thing about ip systems um it's digital so it's not like an analog system where you start to lose picture quality when you 
start cutting the the run up and stuff like that, it's digital. So you're gonna get the nice crisp any image any way you look at it. Um, yeah. What about the material? Whether it's copper or when it comes to Cat Five, the in terms of image, no, like I said, it's digital. It's gonna be now different materials, different jobs require different materials. So that's of course gonna play a factor in it. Um, but copper is copper, you're gonna get that run. You're gonna get a nice clean clean image from the video because it's digital and it's gonna get converted at the NVR. So you're good there. Um, so how do we break these dim these distance limitations? Uh, there's a product called Ethernet and Power Over Coax. This is a great, great product. Why? This allows you to run 1,500 feet as opposed to 300. So that's about five times the distance. Well, this is using coax. Yeah, this is using coax. You do have to use coax in the middle, but we can break the whole limitation of, of uh, 300 feet. Um, this particular uh, device is also a extender. So you can use it to extend your run. Can you use it as a mid-span? You can use it as a mid-span. This is actually a great device because it has, it's three in one actually. So it could also use it as a power injector to inject power if you don't have a PoE. Um, and it puts it into the cable for you. Well, if you're, if you're not using coax, this is if you want to use coax cable. If you want to use coax. Well, just what if you, I mean, you use network cable. Yeah. You so need uh, some kind of mid span to mid -span. extend your run, right? Yep. So we have, you can use this as a mid span to extend the run further. Um, also, you can use. Oh, what is a mid span? Let's so, just okay, explain yeah. what a mid span is. So a mid span is. is a device that pretty much what it sounds like. It's in the middle and it will extend your run past. So every 300 feet, you can add a mid span and extend that run 300 more feet, 300 more feet. But you have to have a mid span in order to do that. And a mid span could be a router. It could be a switch. It could be um, Ethernet over power device. So any device that's going to amplify that that run further is a mid span. So you so we mentioned that using a, a, an NVR with built-in PoE, you can go 250 feet uh, over network cable using one of these accessories. Exactly. Perfect. We'll extend that. We'll distance. extend that. Yep. Yes. And that's will a good, it double that distance. Well, it'll give you 300 feet further from that distance. So you're going to add 300 to your 250 or 150, or if you're using just a POE, not an NVR, it's going to add 300 to that 300. So now you can go 600. So yeah, it's going to extend 300 from wherever you install that device. Can you use multiple mid spans? You can. You can use multiple mid spans. You can as many as you can afford um, to continue to. That's basically how DSL works. Uh, DSL has a pretty much a mid span device every so often to amplify that signal. Exactly, it's back, exactly how DSL works. So the further away you are, the less speed you have because you're further away from that mid span. Um, and the last device is a step down converter. Um, so runs that exceed 300 feet, or we know that the MVR won't give us the 300, so we need something to amplify that. A 24 volt run goes way further than a 12 volt, but the camera is only 12 volts. So how do I correct that? You need a step down. This device will take that 24 volt, turn it into 12, and you'll be okay. But um, it's hard to see the image on top. But what that is, is a passive power over Ethernet uh, plug. You can plug the power, 24 volt, into that, and it runs it over Ethernet. Similar to a PoE injector, don't get that confused because they can be described as kind of the same uh, description, but it is different. Um, and that's how you would get that run over to your camera using Cat5 or Cat6. We got a question. What's the difference between PoE and PoE Plus in terms of distance? So PoE, PoE Plus, in terms of distance, there's not much difference in terms of distance. But it is, is uh, there is a major difference in uh, how many watts that it carries. So PoE Plus um, is good for PoE PTVs um, because it requires more power. 
Um, and other than that, it's good for home automation. A lot of home automation devices are uh, higher wattage, 24 watts, as opposed to a normal camera that's only 15. Um, in those situations, you are going to need a PoE plus. For the most part, you should be good with a standard PoE 15-watt uh, device. Another question, what about wireless? So wireless in terms of power? IP or IP. So IP cameras. So let me start off by saying there's really no true wireless device because you need to power that device. So you have to have power somewhere. There's going to be a cord plugged into that device you know, to charge it, to power it. So in that sense, why not just run a cable with it? I'm not a fan of the wireless CCTV device because of uh, connectivity issues. Um, you can use a wireless access point. Huh? You can use a wireless access point. That's a little different that does work uh, the only thing you'll have to take into consideration is connectivity issues uh, anything wireless is not always 100% uh, connectivity uh, how would you word it it's not always going to be connected 100% of the time you'll lose for whatever reason uh, connectivity and then that compromises your system so well keep in mind this is video surveillance yeah there's a big difference between our electronic products compared to a consumer is these things yeah. need to be on 24-7 yes. forever, yeah. pretty much. Yeah, and a lot of customers call tell in. Your, tell, me, you tell your customers. Yeah, yeah, they call in, they want, I want wireless. And it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> well, there are ways to go around it. There However, are. you're there are. compromising uh, it functioning properly Yes. And at all times. Yes, and that's a major... A major important factor in CCTV so just keep that in mind let your customers know the issues with wireless so that was um, IP. IP what about analog once again know the limits of your system so analog a whole different ballgame um, a lot of rules apply to analog a lot of people think analog is a lot easier than IP and vice versa IP is pretty simple if you know the limitations uh, analog, you have numerous issue problems that could occur. Uh, cable type, connectors, distance limitations. A big one is video technology. Um, especially now. Especially now, we have a lot of calls yeah. with video technology and power issues. So all these different areas that that uh, we can have problems in. And these are different issues that you may encounter, right? Because yeah, IP video has been around what the last fifteen years. Yeah, yeah. and it really brought a new set of challenges. Yeah. Uh, before that, with analog, we're now high def over coax. These issues have been around since forever. First forever. And <laughs> so. And now with the new HD stuff, it's brought a lot more um, issues that can happen, and a lot of uh, installers have been doing this for a long time. They're used to this normal analog, and so now they're like, "Well, what's going on? Isn't this analog? Why are we having these issues?" So we're going to explain why they happen, how to correct them, and how not to run into them. So, distance again? Yeah, so distance again, but this time with analog, one of the biggest issues that we face. Uh, you have the right cables for the job. The distance is probably one of the biggest issues. Um, the wrong cable can get you no video, can get you interference, it's numerous, numerous issues. So power, once again, this is just a quick diagram of, of distance limitations you get when it comes to uh, analog and power. A lot of people like to use uh, Cat5. So we re always recommend that you use more than one pair when you're running Cat5 using Balins. Um, and you can see you almost double the distance you can go by doubling the pairs. And of course... Well, they're using Balins with the screw yeah. terminals, right? Yeah, this is Balins with screw terminals. Um, and also power cable to the right. No limitations of the gauge. Um, like I said earlier, map out, map out your install. Know how, know your distances. Know what cable you're going to have to use in order to do these runs. It'll eliminate a lot of issues later on. So keep in mind your gauge, the type of cable that you're using, and the volt, the uh, your power supply. Yeah. Of uh, voltage voltage and how many amps amps is very important when yeah. it comes to analog especially for longer runs yes. you get asked all the time 
my run is 300 feet, 400 feet, 200 feet. Um, these are some things that you might want to take a look at. Yeah. Um, first and foremost. You know? Yeah. So coax cable. Typically, there's three types of coax cable that are used in the industry. RG59 is probably the most it's favorite of the installers. Um, it's cheaper. It's most commonly used. You get about 750 feet. And it'll go it'll go higher depending on you know certain factors, but an average seven hundred fifty feet a run. And then so there's RJ six. This is probably the least used. It's harder to work with. You do get further distances with it, but it's just harder to work with. It was more common with CATV than CCTV. Yes. Correct. And then finally RJ eleven, and it's probably used least in CCTV. It's hard to work with. It's thicker. Um, but your distances are way longer than you would a normal uh, RG59. It's also more expensive. Um, but once again, know your limitations, know what you can do with each cable. You might need to run a uh, different cable for different runs just for that one run to get the video out there. Or different power. Or different power. Um, another issue is the uh, connector. A lot of issues with connectors. You want to make sure always that 95% of that braid on the BNC um, is, is adequate shielding for electrical interference. That's why it's there, um, to block that electricity from getting to the main uh, copper. Um, so when you guys are buying wire, look at the coverage of the braid yeah. of the RG59. Mm -hmm. and I mean, there's um, wires out there at different price points. Just might make sure that you're buying the right quality of cable that you need. Or buy a good quality. Yeah. A wire. Yeah, and that's why there's different. There, there is different qualities. Um, and another thing is make sure that you have at least three eighths of an inch braided back when you install that that uh, BNC because that's going to prevent interference as well from the braiding that's actually you know getting rid of the electrical interference. You don't want that being able to make interference with the actual BNC causes a lot of issues. So let's take a look at, at our, our uh, distance limitations. So RG59 coax, so it looks like they're flipping around. Flipped around yeah. So RG59, uh, the maximum distance is 750 feet. Yeah, and, and you can, most installers say, well, I've ran further than that. So yeah, you can. There's instances where you can go further, but to be on the safe side. And this is optimal conditions. Optimal conditions, exactly. I mean, they have interference, high voltage wires, you have turns and numerous issues that can happen when, especially a long run. So And keep in mind, this is for video. Yes. If you're using Siamese cables, your power distance isn't as long as your video distance. Correct. Correct. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys a chart in a moment that actually show you how the power gets diminished throughout the run. Um, um, all right, um, Cat Five E network cable. Yeah. So why why use Cat Five? Why use uh, UTP? Well, for one, you get longer runs. Um, it's easier to install. If you're using video balins, uh, especially power balins, you can run one cable that runs. Uh, if you have a PTZ or audio, they actually have a data two data wires, um, power video all through one cable. So you're uh, recommending using network cable for network cable, yeah. It's just it's easier. Um, not always not in every instance, but certain situations, yeah. You can do it's a lot more flexible, a lot easier to work with. Um, but Balens with Balens become issues come with Balens. A lot of uh, connectivity issues. You know, you didn't make sure that those pairs are tightly locked into the terminals. Um, they're nice and secure, um, and like we said earlier, always you want to use the more pairs, the better. You get better transmission. You don't have to worry about uh, one breaks. You have three more. It's just it's better to use double. You have it there, so it means we'll use it. So a couple of Balin styles. You have your your screw terminal. Yeah. And yeah, so screw terminal. Um, and at the bottom, towards the bottom, you can see uh, some of the limitations. You know, 1080p, 720. Um, some of the 
the current valence now can support high the high, high def, def they can um, all high def um, technologies. Then we have the all in one. This is you terminate the whole cable. Yeah, this is the the video power bands I was speaking about earlier that actually have the data cable on them. Will this give you a longer distance? It'll give you a longer distance. It will. So you're going to get uh, all in one package with these have pigtails connected to them. Um, yeah, these are probably favorites of mine. Okay, so let's talk about video technology. This is uh, kind of a hot topic um, today, and we've had webinars about this in the past. Um, another issue is not realizing what video format video technology is needed or being used. Uh, compatibility issues arise when an installer or a new user tries to install uh, one technology with another, especially you have different camera technologies and you have uh, recorder technologies. Okay? Right. Just make sure that this to make sure that you're using the correct technology so it will work. Yeah. Okay, so, so currently um, there's a few formats out there. Um, there is AHD, analog high definition. This is actually uh, what we use for our cameras. Uh, and of course, they're hybrid. Um, there's HD CVI, and there's HD TVI, <laughs> and there's an older format HD SDI, and then there's the trad traditional analog. Correct. And so this chart here shows each camera's cap compatibility, capability, um, and one of the reasons why we decided to um, inherit the AHD technology is because it's the most compatible. It's easy to work with. You can go down the line and see that it works with any cable type. Um, it does have hybrid solutions. Um, just numerous reasons you can look down the chart and see that reason why we chose AHD to be our technology. If you get asked, what's the difference between the TVI and the AHD camera? This is a good question because there's a lot of people out there that are like, I don't understand what this means, TVI, AHD. So the last two, three years has really taken off uh, high def. Well, there are different video formats created by different companies. Different companies. Kind of like uh, I want to compare it to when, when Blu-ray came out, there was HD, DVD, Blu-ray, kind of fighting for the who was going to be on top of the technology, Blu-ray run, one. Um, so I want to compare it to that. Same and situation. As far as resolution, on in you know, honesty, uh, you know, well, you have to look at um, the you know the your specific camera's quality, you know, of the of the image sensor um, and the built. But if they're 1080, then they're very, very comparable. Very comparable. However, you know, there's features that that differ from each other. Yeah. Depending on what video format you're using, but what you just want to know is. You're using the same format of cameras yeah. and DVRs for the most part. For the most part. But there's, for example, our, our DVRs yeah. um, is compatible with HD, TVI, and uh, analog. Yeah, so what we did, we seen that uh, the two probably most used technologies were uh, HD, TVI, and HD. So when we created our, our HD DVRs, we said, well, let's incorporate the TVI, even though we feel ours is superior. For people who have them, they can still keep their cameras and slowly bring over AHD. Our DVRs are tribrid, actually, more than hybrid. So we can do 960 traditional analog, AHD, and HD TVI. So as what we mentioned, distance. So um, what's the difference between the formats? So HD, TVI, and AHD are almost identical in terms of and features CVI, yeah. and CVR in terms of distance, in terms of um, you know picture quality, um, well, things they, like that. The only one that's really behind is HD SDI. Yeah. Um, this was one of the first technologies for high def or collapse that came out. Um, we had some people that loved them, um, however, they've been pretty much replaced. Yeah. Uh, but you're looking at just a 150 foot distance and 
um, you you know you need to use certain quality of wire and a lot of limitations. There's a lot of limitations that was eliminated by the newer formats, which is the uh, AHD, TVI, and CVI formats. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, we came out with our DVR, and so it's tribrid, and I believe we just got um, cameras in that are quad bred, I guess. They are newest yeah, cameras. Yeah, so it, it's, it's, it'll be pretty soon. Actually, they're available now, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cameras that are AZ compatible, TVI, CVI, and analog. So you can get that camera yeah, and throw it on yeah, any we'll system. Out, yeah, we'll see those yeah. out there. So it won't really matter. Yeah. Uh, however, for what you already have on hand and what's being sold in the market in the last two years, make sure that you're using the right yeah, formats. Right format. So make sure before you buy that camera, before you install that camera, know the DVR, know the model number, know its, once again, know its, its restrictions and its, what, what that actual DVR can do. So moving on, so power issues. Um, like you mentioned, a lot of these issues have something to do with power and not defective product. And yeah, so yeah, 27% is probably a power issue. Um, and so like I said earlier, I was gonna bring out a chart that talks about um, the DVR run with RG59 and the camera. Uh, if you look at the chart, you can see the limitations in feet um, you have by itself and then when it's connected to a DVR as well as uh, wire gauge how many amps you're going to need to travel a certain distance and carry a certain load of amperage pretty important that's just really important probably one of the most important things to know when running um, distance so let's talk about uh, Ground. So these are the rolling lines. Yeah. yeah. So you see these rolling lines automatically. Uh, if you've been doing this a while, you know that it's a power issue. Um, most of the time, power box, you're thinking rolling lines. But once in a while, you will see a line similar to the one in the picture that just sits there. Doesn't. It's not rolling. Just there. And it's clearly power. But don't be so quick to think that it's the power box. It's something called a ground loop. What is a ground loop? A ground loop is um, a double grounded circuit. Um, and there's situations where I, I talked about a little bit earlier where a whole location can be, have a ground loop. And there's nothing you can do as an installer uh, or us as a manufacturer to correct that. It is an electrician needs to come out and remove that double what do they need to ask for? So, ask an electrician to remove the double. So to find it first of all, and find it. yeah, and sometimes it's as simple as just moving over to a new circuit. You know, the put it on a different on a different plug that might sometimes correct it. Um, not always though. Like I said, sometimes the whole location has that problem, and there's nothing. So always bench test. Once again, always bench test before you take it out there. Make sure it's not the power box. Make sure it's not the camera. It's not the it's not the DVR. When you get there, you have that issue. We've had instances where customers are like, this camera's not working. I've switched three, four cameras out. It's have the same problem. It's because it's not the camera. It's not the DVR. It's the actual location of the, the system. And there's not much you can do about it except getting someone out there to, an actual electrician out there to get there and fix it. And that could be, could be expensive sometimes. Another... Um, uh, video when your friends you might see is something like this. Um, Don't ever mount your cameras to a metal surface. Yeah. Uh, surges are really a, a, a big reason for electrified surface or bleeding. Uh, bleeding uh, is a result of something being wired improperly that that the current is making contact with a conductive surface. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? So it might not even be your wiring. It might be something else in the house where it's touching a piece of metal connected to the building. And when you did your install, you connected the camera to that same piece of metal. It could be on the back side of the location, but it's still connected. And so electricity, static, 
will bleed through that metal conductive material into your image. Um, and this happens a lot. So how do you correct that? You know, one of the things is a plastic junction box will separate. It doesn't allow that electricity to transfer over through the metal because there's no metal. It's mm. plastic. Um, it's a simple fix. It's a very simple fix. Um, most of the time, you probably need a junction box anyways. Just make sure that it's not going to conduct any electricity over to the camera and cause interference. So it has to be uh has plastic. to be plastic or something non-transferable um, uh, with electricity. So we, we're talking about power. How, for example, um, I'm looking at a camera on the spec sheet. It says it's a 300 milliamp uh, power consumption. However, it's got IRs. So how do I want to uh, set up my power? Do I give the cameras uh, a half amp or a full amp? So we like to say, be on the safe side, one amp per camera. Because you got to take into consideration distance. Um, IR is coming on. So one amp should be sufficient for your run. Of course, if you have way longer runs, you're going to need more, stronger power, more amps, more voltage. Um, but for the most part, you're safe with one amp. Per camera. Okay, so uh, there it is. Uh, we went over uh, some common problems uh, that you encounter, uh, whether it shows on the on the images, uh, whether it's a ghosting image, um, some issues with nighttime um, images with IRs on, um, uh, ground loops, um, rolling lines, uh, bleeding. Um, and hopefully we're able to give you guys some tips on how to overcome these challenges. Uh, we're going to keep answering questions, um, but that's um, pretty much our, our webinar today. Um, again, just type in any questions and we'll go ahead and answer them. And thank you guys for attending. Um, FYI, we have recorded this webinar and uh, we will email you guys uh, the YouTube link of this webinar along with the rest of our past webinars and we have quite a bit of um, archived webinars uh, watch them they're great um, if you need further information about uh, any Bolide uh, surveillance product uh, go to our website www.bolideco.com uh, but send us an email uh, follow us on Twitter on YouTube and again I want to thank you guys uh, for joining us on today's webinar. Uh, we're going to have another webinar on next month, and we'll send you guys an invitation um, for that the next webinar. Thank you guys for your time. We appreciate it. We're going to stand by and, and, and answer some questions. Yeah. But, yeah, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, hopefully uh, we were able to give you guys some uh, good tips today.